Hey, Dom. Hello. Hello. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Let's see here. Got a few more people joining us. Great. Hello. Good evening. Let's see. Looks like we've got a few rogue Texans logging in here too. Thank you for joining everybody. Hey, Karen. Hi, hey, Wyatt. Rick. Rick and Sue, good to see you guys. Hey, Alan. Hi there. Good evening. We're going to keep on letting a few people log on here. It looks like we've got a good group showing up. That's great. Let's see. Yeah, I'll get about 13 people. We'll give it about another another minute and just see if we get any more folks. And then we're going to jump right in because we got one hour together tonight. Let's see here. Y'all enjoying the snow in New Hampshire? Uh -huh. <laughs> this has been a snowy February. My goodness. Had, um, gosh, we're, we're coming up on two feet of snow down here on the seacoast just since February 1st. Well, you've got more than we've got up here in Waterville Valley, so. Okay, yeah, we've had, we've had quite a bit down here. All right, boy, we got more people joining. This is great. All right, I'm going to give it about 15 more seconds and then we got to make tracks. So um, just one more moment, and we'll get a few more people. Good to see everybody. Okay, so good evening all and welcome to the February New Hampshire Astronomical Society uh, Sky Tour. Really glad that you could come out and do this with us. Um, as you probably know, with the pandemic, we've had to move a lot of things online, but this has actually been one of those things that's gone really, really well. Um, and as the pandemic ends, we're going to come back with live sky watches uh, across the state. But for now, this is the way we're getting together. Uh, and so it's cool to see that we can reach folks all over the country doing this. And we do have folks from all over the country tonight on the call. So that's fantastic. Um, so I'm Wyatt Davis, I'm the 2021 president, and I'm really glad you've joined us. Um, quickly about the New Hampshire Astronomical Society, we're almost 200 amateur astronomers from around the state uh, who share a passion for the stars. So, you know, hey, look at this guy, Steve Rand there, one of, one of my fellow members, uh, several other members on the call. Uh, but we all share a passion for the stars. We love to do education work uh, and we do this type of outreach all over the state and now via Zoom all over the world. So we're glad that you could join us. Uh, the purpose tonight is to just get really practical and basic and share with you a series of resources and to encourage you to kind of give you the tools to get out and um, get out under the stars. Uh, so I'm gonna take you through several different resources on that. Um, and I am going to, if I may, by the way, we are recording this. So if you want to go back for any notes, you'll be able to see it on our YouTube channel. Um, and I also have an observing guide that you can get from me after the meeting. You can email me at president at nhastro.com. I'll be glad to send you the observing guide, the observing list, and all the resources I'm going to talk about are linked to there. Uh, so you don't need to take copious notes. We'll have everything covered for you. So let me share my desktop really quickly. And I'm going to take us fast over here to the um, to this observing guide and just give you a little orientation to what you're going to see here and then we can start to jump in. So up here on the top and again these are all linked and once this is over I'll actually link this guide as well so you can download it if you want but we're going to give you a sky map uh, that you can use for the month of February for New Hampshire. It also works for Texas. It also works for Oregon. So for those of you who are on the call uh, that are across the country, that works. We're going to give you a link to a really cool graphic for some signposts in the sky that I think you'll be able to use right away that should be helpful. Uh, I'm going to give you a date and time and moon chart 
for New Hampshire. And this is going to come in handy. Uh, but this is just going to let you know when we talk about astronomical dawn or astronomical dusk, when does that actually happen throughout the month of February and where will the moon be at that time as well? So I'm going to give you that link. Um, I will link you in this document to the actual logs so that you're able to download these and record your observations. Uh, I've got a couple of other just general reference uh, sites here that I think you might find interesting. And I do want to point up, and I'm going to mention it right now at the top of the hour, uh, a resource here that I think is just fantastic and, and really wonderful. It's throughout the state of New Hampshire, and that's our library telescope program. And Mr. Steve Rand, who is on the call, is one of the pioneers, so hats off to you, sir. But when you click on this link, and let's just do it really quickly, for those of you who haven't been there before, you'll find a very appropriate Robert Frost poem quote, because we're in New Hampshire, after all, uh, from the Stars Blatter. Uh, so that's kind of fun. But the point is that you can go to many, many libraries throughout the state and check out this very high quality reflector telescope uh, that comes with eyepieces, comes with instructions, everything you need. And on our YouTube channel and on our website, there are some fantastic um, instructional videos featuring Mr. Steve Rand that will let you go outside right away and start using a, a really quality telescope. So I encourage you to check that out literally, no pun intended, but go look into it. Um, and you can just see the list of all the libraries there. Uh, and I think there's a map down here showing where all these telescopes are around the state. It's a fantastic program. It's actually been recognized nationally and internationally. It's a pioneering initiative. Uh, we're very proud of it. So we hope you'll take advantage of it. We have noted that one of the scopes has migrated to Maine. We're searching for it. Now that's just a joke. So anyway, that's a resource for you out there. Okay, having said all that then, um, I do want to point you up to one of the specific ideas here, which is the moon notes. And let me just take you there. Um, this shows you moonrise, moonset, sunrise, sunset for every day in February in New Hampshire. And this will vary slightly if you're down in Texas, for example, but you can use the same website to set your location and find these, these times. But the reason we're, we've got this here for you is when we talk about these objects tonight, there are times of the month when these are you know, potentially better based on the moon. So I just want to clue you into that and help you get oriented in that direction. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, so I've covered, I think, most of the resources that I'd like to cover right now. Um, we've talked about the time references. I'm going to get into a list of objects now. And let me just talk about how you go about doing this. These objects are selected for a reason. I want to put up here for you one of those linked resources. And again, you, you don't need to take notes. You can just get the guide. But we're going to give you a really basic sky map uh, for the night sky. All, almost all, there's one, one trick entry on the log list. Uh, almost all of the targets that we're going to talk about tonight are on this map. And so you can use this with a red flashlight. A uh, red flashlight helps your eyes dark adapt and, uh, at night and, and, and you can see better uh, after dark. But you can just use this in a flashlight. You don't need a telescope. You don't need binoculars. You can walk right out and see several of the things we're going to talk about tonight. And that's a lot of fun. So I encourage you to think of it that way. We also are going to talk about targets, though, that are wonderful in binoculars. So if you've got a pair of binoculars at home, and it can be any pair, um, it can be the simplest pair. Here's a pair of opera glasses from 1920. These would actually work, believe it or not. So anything you've got, they're wonderful um, instruments to go star watching with. So that's a possibility. And of course, if you have a home telescope or you check out a library telescope, all of these targets are going to be wonderful. So having said all that, um, I'll just kind of step back a little bit. And we're going to use this software tonight quite a bit. This is called Sky Safari. Um, I'm running it on a Mac. You can get a very equivalent version of this for your iPhone or an Android device. And they're super cool and not very expensive. So we're just going to start off right here and kind of hover over planet Earth. And you can probably see right away that we've got here North America. And you can see about where the dusk line is going from east to west across the country as we speak. Um, and if we hone in a little bit, you'll start to see pretty clearly here New England and northern New England. And you can probably make out all the way down to New York here, but coming up to Cape Cod and to Boston and right up the seacoast, if we come in a little bit closer, you'll see that this line of light right here is actually the Merrimack Valley. 
uh, over here, I believe you, you'll find, uh, I think that's the Piscataqua, but this is kind of our general setting. While we're hovering over this, I'm going to make a point, by the way, Montreal, et cetera, up in Canada, uh, St. Lawrence River, you can make out here. One of the points is, two points maybe actually, most of New Hampshire were actually in a pretty good situation for reasonably dark skies at night. And that's a wonderful thing, because if you look in broader aperture, at most, you see some clouds here, but most of the Eastern United States pretty regularly has a tremendous amount of what we will call light pollution. Whereas when you get up into Northern New England and up into Maine and up here, up in the, 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 the Waterville Valley, um, you start to get really nice dark skies. And so that's a great thing. That's point number one. Point number two though is light pollution is a real problem for astronomy. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I put a link on the resource guide to the International Dark Sky Association for your reference, but there are things you can do about light pollution, which include turning off the lights, turning off porch lights, not leaving copious amounts of interior light on when you don't need it at night. But there are things that really can make a difference, a big difference in how you can enjoy the night sky. So I just encourage you to keep that perspective. So having said that, we're now going to come back around uh, and come to our view from the Earth. So I'll see if I can get us out of orbit mode here. Um, and we'll come back to the Earth. And this is, let me see here, let me take this out actually. Here we go. This is what this, the view is going to look like from New Hampshire. Um, we are at about 43 degrees of latitude, so 43 degrees north. Um, and so that gives a cer certain perspective on the sky. If you happen to be down in Texas, for example, um, it's actually, you're going to be about 10 degrees. Well, let me see if I can fix this. Um, you're going to have, you're going to be about 10 degrees further south than we are. There we go. I think, I think we're good. What is going on here? Hang on. Having a bit of, of challenge. Um, let me see if I can get this to fix. Here we go. Let's do this maybe. Hmm. One moment, I'm going to refire that. But if you're down in Texas, you're going to get a little bit of a different perspective. Everything in the sky is going to be shifted about 10 degrees. So just keep that in mind. But when we look at these views that we're going to look at tonight, we're going to look at it from the New Hampshire perspective. And I'm going to start off on the list with some major signposts in the sky. And they're going to include Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, which are the Big, big Dipper and Little Dipper. So let me take you really quickly to one of the linked resources and just show you what this looks like um, in the sky every night and some of these signposts that we're talking about. Here we go. So here's the Big Dipper, and I'm going to put it uh, on the planisphere for you here in just a second. But you're going to notice that this constellation or asterism is actually a really central reference point from which you can find many of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. So we're going to talk about where the Dipper Cup is, where the Dipper Handle is, the relationship to Polaris, the North Star, and the Little Dipper. But as we do that, just keep in mind that once you find this, you find Polaris, you find the Big Dipper, you now have a direct reference point to the entire scope of the sky and some major constellations and stars and many of the objects that we're gonna talk about tonight. So I'm gonna come back and hope that I got this fixed. Let's see, this is crazy. Here we go, here we go. We're better now. Okay, so I wanna start off from New Hampshire and take us to the North Star. There we go. And so, like I said, we're at about 43 degrees north, uh, uh, northern latitude here. And you will notice with Polaris that these markings in the sky, these grids, are degrees up from the horizon. So this is 30 degrees, 60 degrees, going all the way up to the zenith directly overhead at 90 degrees. And you will notice that Polaris is, as it turns out, in altitude about 43 degrees above the horizon. And that's simply because of our latitude. So you'll, you can always know that's the case. In Texas, it's going to be 32 degrees above the horizon. So depending where you are in the northern hemisphere, you're going to see Polaris at different points in the sky. One of the things I'd like to show you here really quickly, um, and I'm going to put up a, a field of view that's going to be very close to what you would see in binoculars. So when you see this little blue circle right here, that's about a binocular field of view. I'm going to put Polaris right there in the center of that. I just want to show you what happens throughout the night with Polaris and with the Little Dipper, which is right here 
anchored as a handle off of Polaris, the North Star. And I also want to show you what happens over here to the Big Dipper uh, in relationship to this. So let me just advance you from right now through one hour increments of the night sky. Watch the Little Dipper, watch the Big Dipper, watch Polaris and the circle. You're going to see that throughout the night, the entire sky, northern sky view, rotates right around the North Star. And that North Star is always at the end of the Little Dipper. And the other thing to point out is now watch the Big Dipper. I'm going to rotate it backwards. And in particular, watch the handle here and the cup. But watch this outer piece of the cup and see that it points directly to Polaris. So if we go backwards and you watch that cup, it points at Polaris all night long. So this is why the North Star is so important to navigation. And when we come back to this idea here of signposts in the sky, why the Big Dipper is so central and the North, the North Star is so central, it always gives you that reference point. So the first two or three things on our guide tonight that I want to point to and suggest that you go out and find first uh, would be the, the Big Dipper, uh, the Little Dipper, and Polaris. So in New Hampshire, it's going to be due north. The North Star is going to be visible all night long, always. And depending on the evening throughout February that you're out in the sky or out under the stars, you're going to see different orientations of Little Dipper and Big Dipper. So I would suggest to you, here's Big Dipper up here, that be your first uh, thing to look for. Look north, look up about 43 degrees, 45 degrees, find the North Star, see this handle coming off of the Little Dipper, look for the Big Dipper and follow these outside stars pointed right back down to the North Star. So that's orientation point number one. Once you're there, now you can link over to a resource like this. Excuse me, let me turn this off. And you can start to map to many of these things we're talking about. All right. So that gets us that far. Now let's come to the observing guide itself and go a little bit further. And I'm going to give you several things that are in the night sky. Some of these are going to be constellations. Some of them are going to be what we call deep sky objects. Some of them are called asterisms, like the Big Dipper. Uh, so I'm going to give you examples, and these are going to span. And you will notice on the observing guide, and again, email me to get this. I'm glad to send it out afterwards, that I've tried to give you some reference points here for what time of the evening or morning might it be best? When will these objects be up, right? And so if we come back and look at the sky and get away from the North Star, let's come around to the south for a moment. You're going to see that the constellations and some of these objects we're talking about, they now don't circle around a point in the sky, they move across the sky and they move from east to west. And so if we advance throughout an evening and just follow Leo up here, the constellation, you're gonna see that Leo goes right across the, the zenith, if you will, uh, kind of in the middle of the night and over towards morning begins to set into the west. So these reference points I'm giving you suggest, when might I go out and look at this? So our first target is a star cluster and it is called M44, the beehive cluster. And let's just look this up real quick. Now, first of all, M44, and I'm gonna take it here for a moment and put it on the transit for you. M44 is famous. Um, and we were just having in our last New Hampshire Astronomical Society meeting a presentation from the gentleman who is the director of the Granger Observatory in Exeter Phillips Academy. Um, and he was pointing out that Galileo actually um, drew a map of this and observed it as one of his very first objects, but it's been known into antiquity. So this is a star cluster. As I come in a little bit closer, you're going to see, and right now, this is this is tomorrow night, and it's about 11 o'clock at night in the evening, and it's going to be basically in the south, very high in the sky, almost 75, 80 degrees up there. And as we come in a little bit closer, let me center this for you, you're going to see, that's that binocular field of, blue, of view, the light blue circle. As we get a little bit closer, M44 is this wide spray of stars that are associated. So as a star cluster, th these are a group of stars that have formed somewhat together. They're gravitationally bound uh, and they're very beautiful. And so 
if you've got good sharp eyes at night in a dark spot, maybe outside away from the city, um, you're going to be able to see M44 with your naked eye. Uh, and I'm going to give you some reference points from those signposts here in a second for where you might locate it. But it is a naked eye object, uh, and it's kind of a nice challenging object, but still pretty doable if you know where to look. Let me take you over to this sky map where we just talked about this. And so we can come over here, and I'm going to just bring this in a little bit. And we're going to look here in a second at a very large asterism called the Winter Circle. I'm going to point it out to you. But we're going to be able to see that M44 is right there on the map. And it basically triangulates between some very bright stars in this Winter Circle. So first object I would suggest for you, M44, uh, the star cluster, naked eye, it's great. It's beautiful. In fact, it's very, very good in a pair of simple home binoculars. Uh, hard to beat, actually, and probably actually one of the very best ways to see M44, maybe even better than a telescope. But if you have a small telescope, like that library telescope we talked about, great view of M44. Now, let's come back out to the broad view here for a second. And I do want to tune you into this other really major signpost in the sky. And let me just see if I can pull this up here. This is not a constellation. This is an asterism. So the Big Dipper is called the Big Dipper. That's a name for an asterism. It's also a constellation, Ursa Major. This is actually a pattern in the sky that anchors off of several major, very beautiful winter constellations. It's called the Winter Circle. Uh, and here we are in midwinter. It's a great time to see it. So once again, let me just take you back to kind of you know, in the evening like just about when it's getting dark. And if you look out to the south, southeast, high up in the sky, you're going to see the winter circle. So this is an asterism. It's made up of several different constellations. It's anchored. It's anchored partially in the constellation Taurus the Bull. It's anchored partially around the constellation Orion. It goes all the way down to the constellation Canis Major. Uh, it comes up through Canis Minor and Gemini and to a, a wonderful constellation that we're going to explore here in a little bit called uh, Auriga. So you can, though, trace these very bright stars, and it's almost an unmistakable, it's not quite a circle, I mean, you can call it a hexagon, whatever you want to call it, but it's called the Winter Circle, uh, and it's an easy thing to find. So just like the, the Big Dipper, um, that's, a, that's a signpost in the sky. When you follow the Big Dipper, from the handle over here to the top of the bowl, it shoots a line straight to this very bright star, uh, Capella, that anchors one of the points on the circle. So that's an easy way to find it. Uh, it is on that signpost a chart that we showed you earlier, right? Here's the top of the dipper shooting straight to Capella in the constellation Auriga. Here are the twins in Gemini that are also a part of the winter circle. And so you go right to this area of the sky, and this is what it looks like. Here are the Gemini, the twins. Here is Capella, and there's the, the Big Dipper. So that helps you kind of orient in. Once we get to the winter circle, there's a lot going on here. And many of the things we're going to talk about tonight anchor right here. Uh, and you know, not coincidentally, February, uh, is a fantastic time to go out and look in the winter circle. There's just so much to see. The first thing I want to observe to you is this kind of stripe in the sky that's going right up here. And this is the Milky Way. Uh, and it turns out that the Milky Way runs right through the winter circle, or we, we might say it differently, the components of the winter circle are in the disk of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, and I think many of you might know this, but I just want to give you an example really quick. If I pick an item, a, a target, right here in this zone of the Milky Way, um, and let me go here really quickly and give you a galaxy view. This is that item I just picked right here, and here is our sun set in the context of the Milky Way galaxy, which is our home galaxy. If you were to look at the galaxy from the top down, this is what it looks like. You can see here's our solar system and here's that deep sky object I just picked that's located in one of the arms of our, of our galaxy. Uh, when you are looking at this sky view, that, we're, that stripe we were talking about earlier, you're basically looking from the Earth in our solar system directly out through these arms of the Milky Way. 
that's why you see that that milky pattern up there because you're seeing this. You'll also notice, and I'm going to point it out to you here in a second, when we look to the other side, either side of the, of the Milky Way, you tend to see darker space. And that's because you're now looking up straight out into space. You're not looking through these arms anymore. So just know that as we talk about it. But the Milky Way is just really gorgeous. And it lights up a lot of what we're talking about here. So you will be able to see that. Milky Way is visible from many, many parts of the state, including some suburban settings, but it's always best from the countryside. So you could, for example, see the Winter Circle from your backyard very brightly, very conspicuously, and you might or might not see the Milky Way. But you can literally go just a couple of miles out from a small city and you'll begin to see the Milky Way. So I point that out to you as well. But we're in the Winter Circle. Let me take you back now to some of the targets that we can see. We first of all talked about the Beehive Cluster, which once again is anchored off the Winter Circle. Here are Gemini the Twins. Here is uh, the uh, bright star in Canis Minor. And right out here triangulated off of these stars is that uh, star cluster M44, and it's on the star chart that we shared. I want to go a little bit deeper here in the Winter Circle and take you to a couple of constellations, and in particular, the constellation Orion. Um, this one is referenced in, Roger, uh, in Robert Frost's poetry, so it's important to New Hampshire folk, uh, but it's right here in the Winter Circle, here on the edge of it. And Orion, I think you may be familiar, is the hunter. And so it's very conspicuous in the, so in the sky. You can see these major four uh, corner stars. You can see these from the brightest city extremely bright. So anywhere you are in the in the evenings and very, very early mornings throughout February, you're going to see Orion very conspicuously. You're going to see the signature three stars that form Orion's belt. And then down here, you're going to see this sword of Orion. Um, and it will initially look like stars. Uh, but as we drill in, we're going to find quite a bit more there that's really interesting. But Orion is just a beautiful constellation, really signature, part of the winter circle, and very, very prominent in the evenings and early, early morning hours in February in New Hampshire. So lovely and, and definitely worth looking at. You can see in relationship to the blue circle, this is a naked eye target. It's way too big for binoculars. It's large in the sky. So just look for this shape. I want to take you in a little bit deeper here, though. <clears throat> into this sword area. And if you look closely with your naked eye, you're going to notice that there's a glow coming out of this, this sword. And it's going to look like a faint blue-green glow. And even in fairly bright settings, not necessarily downtown Manchester, but you'll get in there, uh, you're going to notice that glow if you, if you focus for a while there. And the closer you get, if we take a binocular view and we come out to a, a view about like this, you're going to start to notice that there are a variety of stars in here. And I want to just turn something on for you to illustrate a little bit of what you might actually see here in that glow. This is M42, which is the Great Orion Nebula. And this is basically a, a really, really concentrated section of the sky that is made up of gas and dust, and it's an intense star forming region. And so it does emit this, this massive glow that you can see from Earth. In binoculars, as you see framed here about five degrees, you're gonna see this entire region. So you see the nebula, you see other star clusters like M44, but much smaller in this case, that are just above and just below this, uh, this piece of sky. If you go with sharp eyes, you might even notice that one of the stars in this cluster is a beautiful double star um, that we're going to look at called, uh, 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 I'll remember the name of it here in a second, uh, but it, it'll jump out. If you have a small telescope and you go a little bit closer, now you're going to start to see that there are many, many, many stars in this area. This is called Nar al Sef. sorry, uh, I was trying to remember that. So this is the, a double star here that really glows and shines. If you go a little bit closer with a telescope, you start to see a very, very famous multi-star system right here called the trapezium. And this is easily viewable in a small telescope, like that library telescope that you might check out. Uh, and really a fun target to find. Uh, so I encourage you to, to consider doing that. It's hard to do with binoculars, but you can do it with a telescope. So all within this one 
area, this sword area of Orion, you've got this just massively complex, incredibly beautiful star forming area with star clusters, nebulae, double stars, and it's just a treat. So easy to see with the naked eye from here, great to see with the simplest pair of binoculars from here, and absolutely amazing. Um, uh, Steve will attest, very experienced astronomers probably look at this area of the sky on many of the nights they go out almost always because there's just more to see here and it's really gorgeous. So right up there in the middle of the sky in February, highly recommended within the winter circle, within the constellation Orion in the sword of Orion. I'm gonna keep going and take you up a little bit to another couple of really amazing uh, night sky star clusters th that really shine out here. So I'm gonna keep you in the context, if I may, for a moment of the winter circle, because it's just so easy to find. So let me put that back up here for you. Uh, and now I'm gonna take you just up to the Northwest of that, up high in the sky to this very bright patch of stars right here. And this is the Pleiades. Um, and so, you know, the, I think many of you may know this, but maybe some of you don't. Uh, if you happen to own a Subaru and you look at the logo, the Subaru logo is actually the Pleiades. Let me put this up for you. This is kind of fun. Um, let me do a Subaru logo and I'll do an image of that right here. This is a representation of the, the, the quote unquote seven sisters, the major bright stars uh, in, in the Pleiades. And so it, the joke goes, if you're ever out one night and you're looking at stars and you see the Pleiades coming at you rapidly, you should get out of the road. That's a joke. Anyway, Pleiades as the logo of the Subaru. But if we come back around here, let me take you in on these a little bit more. And by the way, I've used this reference several times. The, the Pleiades are also known as M45. What's the M about? It is called, it's short for Messier. And Messier was a French astronomer in the late 1700s who cataloged many of the most beautiful night sky objects. So modern astronomers refer to objects as M44, M45, M38. That's referring to the Messier catalog. Uh, and it's a really wonderful challenge to go out and try to see all the 109 uh, objects in the catalog. But let's focus in on the Pleiades. Again, an extremely famous um, star cluster that is absolutely beautiful. This was one of the first ones that Galileo actually charted out. You can find hand-drawn pictures of this from, I think it's 1610, that are absolutely beautiful. But this is an intensely bright um, cluster of very young, very hot stars that does look, if you follow this shape right here, a little bit like a kite. Uh, and is often called the Seven Sisters because of these major seven bright components. So this is again, the naked eye view, it's unmistakable. You will see the Pleiades from the brightest parts of the state. And again, it'll be basically just to the northwest, up high in the sky above Orion. You could almost say that the belt of Orion is kind of pointing right to the Pleiades. Easy way to find it. If we go to that star chart that I was telling you about that you can link to, here is, oops, woo, here's Orion right here. Here's the belt and right there, M45, the Pleiades, right? So easy to find just with your naked eye, high in the sky, just outside the winter circle. Now, if we do put it into that binocular field of view and we bring it to the full screen, so about what you'd see in your home binoculars, this is the view and it's intensely bright, it's intensely beautiful. Um, this little string of stars right here is popularly known as Ali's Braid. Uh, because of, it comes off of this very bright star Alcyon. And as the seven sisters, the seven major stars are often referred to as sisters, that's Allie, that's her braid. You can see it clearly in binoculars and it's gorgeous. If you have a small telescope, it just gets better from there. Um, you can come in on the Pleiades and just like in many of the star clusters that we're gonna talk about tonight, you can start to notice easily with a, with a simple backyard telescope, beautiful double stars. Uh, and if you're in dark skies, you may even notice some of this light blue nebulosity that surrounds these stars. It's a breathtaking cluster, breathtaking. Uh, beautiful with the naked eye, beautiful with binoculars, beautiful with the telescope. 
one other kind of fun, two other fun stories about this, and we're moving quickly. One is if any of you are J.R.R. Tolkien fans, and you happen to have read the Lord of the Rings in the first book, when the hobbits are leaving Hobbiton and they're saved by, from, with the, from, they're saved by the elves from the Dark Riders, just in the woods in Hobbiton, um, they wake up early in the morning and they notice the netted stars. It's pretty much established that reference is specifically to this star cluster. So that's kind of cool in case you're a fan, just so you tie it off that way. Um, and let's see, the other story about this one is it's about, I believe, 44 million years old. And so, yes, in fact, there are dinosaurs, um, or it's 44 million, yeah, 44 million years old. There were dinosaurs who walked on the earth who couldn't see the Pleiades because it wasn't visible yet. So a very young star cluster that's just appeared in the recent geological past, if you will, or astronomical past. So that's the Pleiades, great, great target. Really encourage you to go check that one out. I'm gonna keep moving quickly and take you to a different star cluster that has a challenge. So this is the one that isn't on the chart, or one of the ones that isn't on the chart, that I just want to point you out to here really quickly. So the first one is the star cluster M38. Once again, we're in the context of the winter circle. I'm going to put that back up for you. This is your major signpost in the sky um, that will help you find these things. I'm going to put you in that context, looking to the south, southeast, and way up high here is this very bright star Capella, which anchors one of the, the points in the winter circle. Within that, it borders on the constellation Auriga. And again, if we were to look over here at our star chart, you're gonna be able to see this and print it out and take it outside with you. You don't need to buy anything. It's free, easy to use. Here's that winter circle. Here's that bright star Capella. And here is the constellation Auriga. And you will notice a couple, actually several, beautiful star clusters that chain through the Milky Way right here. Uh, and I'm going to point one to you, but you could go hit all five, four or five of these very easily with binoculars. But there's a star cluster here called M38. Let me take you to M38, and I want to show you the bonus piece about this. It's kind of the challenge and might be fun if you happen to have a small telescope. So this is called the Starfish Cluster. It's right in the middle of Auriga. It's right in the middle of the stream of the Milky Way. We come in with binoculars and you're gonna see some easy, interesting patterns here that, that kind of show right up. These patterns of stars and in particular, what looks like a big C almost or pinchers, the kind of two arcs of stars that will pop out in binoculars and they will point to what looks like a glow in the sky. That's the star cluster M38. Now, if you do have a small telescope or you choose to go check out a library telescope, this becomes a really beautiful and interesting, really fine star cluster in a small telescope that really pops out, it's interesting. The challenge is to look for its neighbor right here, which is NGC 1907. This is also a star cluster. And as a matter of fact, and I won't remember the details perfectly, it looks smaller here. As a matter of fact, in actual physical terms, it's probably close to the same size as M38. It's just much further away. So this star cluster is in the foreground. This one's in the far background. And as a result, this one is smaller and it's fainter. But if you train your eyes and you get dark adapted, and even with a small telescope, you can see this other star cluster back in the background behind this big, bright, beautiful star cluster, M38. So M38 is on that star chart that I, I just printed for you or, or pointed you to. You know, night NGC 1907 is not, but it's right in the same telescopic field of view. So it's an interesting challenge target to cause you to go out and exercise that telescope a little bit and see what this looks like. But beautiful part of the sky, right in the stream of the Milky Way. And as I pointed out, and I didn't put it on the observing guide, but they're on the star chart, um, just to the east southeast of M38 is another beautiful star cluster you can see in the same binocular field of view. If you were to pan down a little bit further, you're picking up now three star clusters in that binocular field of view. And we go just a little bit further beyond that. And there's another beautiful star cluster here, M37. We keep on coming down and I'll come out a little bit to get some perspective on this. Just down here to the south, there's an amazing complex within Gemini that's marked on your star chart of gorgeous star clusters that are great with binoculars, great with telescopes, 
just a fabulous part of the sky. Again, let's kind of bring the aperture back. All of this is happening inside the winter circle. Easy to find and really just gives you a wide, wide variety of things that you can find. This is right in the heart of the winter circle that we were just looking at. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. Now, let's come back to this. We're doing okay. We're about 20 minutes till the top of the hour. I'm gonna keep going fast. Let's come back to a few other things here that I'd like to point out. Um, and there will be several things on this list. All of them, again, are on that star chart, so you can find them. But I'd like to give you a little bit more markers in the sky. Um, so I want to first go to the planets. And I want to go to the path of the planets. So let me take you back all the way to the big view here again. And let's reorient. Let's go from the north and Polaris and the Little Dipper. And let's rotate around over here to the Big Dipper with the handle, the Dipper Cup pointing straight up here to the Winter Circle uh, and getting us into this section of the sky. Now, I wanted you to come around from the north all the way to the south and look due south. And I want to point out this yellow line in the sky right here that arcs from the east all the way over to the west. This line is called the ecliptic, and you can see it right here. And more or less, not precisely, but more or less, this is the planet or the path that the planets go, uh, go through the sky along. All right, so you can see if you look closely here, that as a matter of fact, there's Mars, right? And we're talking about tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And right here, difficult with the naked eye, but very possible with binoculars, is Uranus, believe it or not. And you can certainly see the colors, right? This one tending to be green, this one tending to be red. But notice that both of them are more or less right on that ecliptic path. Now, I want to do what I did with the Big Dipper here with the, with the ecliptic. Just watch this for a second. And I'm going to advance you into the evening and just keep an eye on these planets. We're going to go one hour, two hours, three hours, and you'll see that as the evening wears on, the planets follow that ecliptic path. If we were to back this up a little bit and take it all the way into the midday, let me move this back here where you can watch this in full relief for a moment. We're moving back towards the midday, you'll see that the planets follow that path right across the sky. So keep that in mind. That's a big deal. This is the middle of the day, so you won't see it. But guess what? Yep, there's Jupiter, there's Saturn, there's Mercury. If we were to fly out to Jupiter and look back towards the sun, guess what we would see on the ecliptic? The Earth. So, you know, this is just a really important marker in the sky and kind of a place to get oriented. Let me take you back now to astronomical dusk, so nighttime. We won't say tonight because it's snowing, but on a clear night, hopefully soon, when you look in the south and you look high up, you're instantly going to see with your naked eye, Mars. Very bright, very red, absolutely conspicuously not a star because of that bright red color. Uh, and it's gonna be again, right there on the ecliptic. It does just happen to be, in this case, very close to a couple of our other targets. There are the Pleiades, M44. I'll make this a little bit bigger for you. Uh, there are the Pleiades. Here's Orion. We talked about Orion's belt pointing up towards the Pleiades. In this case, during February, because these do move throughout the year, but right now, you would find that that belt points kind of generally towards Mars. Um, here's our binocular field of view again. So if we come over here, you'll notice that Mars is separated from Uranus right now by about two binocular fields of view. So you can find both of these planets there. Mars is a very difficult planet to observe with a telescope if you're trying to see any details. And right now it's actually moving away from the Earth. So it's getting smaller and fainter. Um, it will get larger and brighter, very bright actually, next fall around October. But for now, it's still great to see with the naked eye. With binoculars, you're just going to basically see a brighter big circle. You're not gonna see a lot of details on Mars with binoculars, but uh, if you do have a small telescope, and this is, uh, it's certainly possible, you could do this if you're skilled with one of the library telescopes. If we take Mars and we start to crank up the magnification on a good night, you're going to start to see some interesting things here. You will begin to see with Mars some light 
colorations. And again, this is a backyard telescope. I've seen this with a four inch telescope. The library telescope you can check out is a six inch telescope. You'll start to see some light markings. And at certain times of the year, you'll even see uh, the ice caps. Uh, you can see the southern ice cap, I believe it is. It's, it's southern or northern, one of the ice caps on Mars with an amateur telescope. So this is a more of a challenge. Uh, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do, but if you do have your own telescope and you can get high magnification and a steady night, you might be able to see this. But at a minimum, you can certainly see it with binoculars. You can certainly see it with your naked eye. Somewhat similar, but maybe even more difficult with Uranus. This is going to look in a binocular field of view. You probably won't see it with your naked eye, but with binoculars, you will. And one easy way to do that is to just come right over here and look at this constellation and these major stars and to take your binoculars and put the field of view right on the edge of one of those bright stars. And then just mentally note to yourself, if you can get your binoculars to edge on that bright star, all you need to do from there is just bump over a half a field and there's Uranus in the middle of the field of view. And it's easily seen with binoculars. If you're a patient and you look carefully, you will notice that it's actually bright green. Uh, so it does not look like a star in that sense. And it's kind of a fun challenge uh, with binoculars to go find that. So I encourage you to check it out. And again, just as a major construct in the sky to understand about the ecliptic. And you will find that, yes, the moon also goes along the ecliptic. So while we're at it on the moon, I wanna take you back to the moon notes for a moment. The moon is one of the very best things you can view in the night sky. Uh, and so we've talked about when it's going to be up. And, and for astronomers like me who love deep sky objects like star clusters and nebulae and galaxies, sometimes we, we view a, the moon a bit askance, but it's still a spectacular target. And so I pointed out when you're going to have moonless nights, which is through about February 14th. But then you're actually going to start having progressively more of a moon in the evenings um, and moonless mornings. And then towards the end of the month, just a whole lot of moon, so very bright. But in particular, I want to point out to you circa February 16th. Let's just go there for an interesting time for the moon. So let me take you there right now. And let's go to astronomical dusk. In fact, let's just go to like a little bit before that. Here's the moon. And again, we're facing south. We are just over from the winter circle, not too far from Mars. So just looking to the west and you can see the moon right here. I'm going to center it for you. And the reason it's on the ecliptic, like we've been talking about, the reason we point out this time is that first of all, it's still high enough in the sky to be seen in the evening easily. And as we talked about before, if you were to wait till midnight, for example, well, the moon's gonna be down, right? So we want to, you wanna go out a little bit earlier on February 16th in the early evening. And the reason we point this out is that when the moon is in this phase, so not fully illuminated, but just more of kind of a crescent, um, with a pair of binoculars, something amazing starts happening you start to be able to see this really interesting detail. And the reason it's easy to see when easier to see than when it's a full moon is that when the full moon is up, it's so bright, it just washes out details. But here you've got only a crescent, you've got this line of demarcation called the terminator, and it begins to actually illuminate features like mountain ranges and like craters. And you start to see some relief in even binoculars. And with a small telescope, you kind of need to fasten your seatbelt because when you start to come in on the moon with a small telescope, when it's in this phase, think February 16, 17, 18 in the early evening, you begin to see absolutely spectacular detail. And this is not overstated. This is, this is what you will see with a small telescope. And you can begin to see obviously any you know, number of major craters, minor craters, craterlets within craters, uh, mountain ranges that cut along, deep rills, etc. One of the most exciting things you can really see in the sky. It, it, it's hard to beat the moon for detail. And with a small telescope, that starts to be the view. Uh, again, just a particular slice of the month. It's great to see the moon anytime. But this is a really good time, kind of February 16th in the early evenings, going towards the 18th or 19th. Um, so check that out. I think you're going to find that's a really great time to see that. 
Okay, we're getting close and I wanna make sure we've got time for some questions or comments. I put a couple of things else on here that I just wanna see if we might wanna point out really quickly. I'm gonna take you to the morning time. So we talked about the Milky Way. Um, I do want to, to point out that the Milky Way is going to be best, um, let's see here, in the evenings, all month long, pretty much, and definitely away from bright city lights. I think this is the one thing on this list that it's, you might see it from your backyard. I can see it from my backyard here in Rye, but it's just so much better, you know, when you get out just a little bit away from a city. So keep that in mind and know that it's going to span the sky from the Southwest up through the, the Zenith directly overhead over to the Northwest, sorry, Southeast up to the Zenith and over to the Northwest. And when the moon is up, it's gonna be very difficult to see the Milky Way. So when we talk about, you know, that the latter part of the month where a lot of moon, that's your best time for some of the very best, for the very brightest things like the planets or like the very bright constellations. So just keep that in mind. Um, that being said, I do wanna give you a morning target um, or two here that are kind of fun. So let's go over here. All this has been in the evening. Let me take you to astronomical dawn. And I wanna come back to the bigger sky here really quickly. We'll take you back to the south where we've been looking. In fact, I may take you to the Big Dipper here in a second. And I'll just take you to like 4 a.m. I tend to be up and I, I do a lot of my, my stargazing in the morning because it's quiet and dark out there. Some of you may be morning people, so I'm gonna point this up for you. Um, the first one that I'm gonna point out, which is on your star chart, is this very large star cluster here called Melot 111. And so Melot 111 is one of the broadest, most diffused um, star clusters out there. The way you find it, you look to the south. And in fact, let me just bring you all the way back around to the Big Dipper here really quickly. So here is Polaris. Here's the Little Dipper. Here's the Big Dipper, right? And now you're gonna be able to come below the Dipper Cup basically right here and come down to this very bright, conspicuous constellation, Leo the lion. And then right up above Leo, especially if you're in any kind of reasonably dark sky, if you look carefully with your naked eye, you're gonna to start to see a glow right here. Um, and I probably don't say it right, but I believe the constellation, which is actually fairly unremarkable, is called Coma Berenices, which is the hair of Bernice. I think it's something like that. Steve's shaking his head. I hope I got that right, Steve. Okay, good. Um, but you'll notice a glow and, and it will maybe even remind you of like, it kind of looks like hair or something up there. But let me center this for you and notice that it fits in this binocular field of view. And I'm gonna take you in a little bit further. And with binoculars, this is just a spectacular five degree field of very bright stars. Um, and again, with reasonably dark skies, you're gonna see it with some patience with your naked eye in the early morning. Putting a pair of binoculars on it of any type starts to light up all this beautiful complexity. And again, even in binoculars, you're gonna notice interesting things like double stars and multi stars throughout here. That's a double star there. So a lot of detail and a lot of things that are just really interesting. If you're really good, there are a couple of very bright galaxies here that you might actually just detect, might need a telescope for that, but they're in this area as well. So an interesting thing with a telescope. So that's a great morning um, uh, object that I, I'd like to make sure you have on your radar. And lastly, I wanna take you to um, another asterism and a quick look at a deep sky object. So I'll take you to the Keystone. Here's the keystone. It looks like a keystone. It's in the constellation Hercules, all right? And when we talked about our, sky, our signposts in the sky earlier, you know, one of the, the major reference points that was on here is off the end of the, of the dipper, big dipper handle to this asterism of the keystone. So let's just do that really quickly. Here we've got the big dipper right here. Here's the handle. And if you follow it straight out, you come right over to the keystone. Easy to see, very bright, very conspicuous shape in the sky, asterism. In the edge of that asterism right here is a globular cluster. 
And this is not an open star cluster like the ones we've been talking about. This is a massive, super dense ball of millions and millions of stars that orbits actually, or kind of floats in the halo of our Milky Way galaxy. So when you find the keystone and you look at this long side over here, so longer up, shorter down, and this outer edge of the keystone, M30, M M13, Messier 13, sits right on that border. Let me put it in the center for you. In binoculars, you're going to start to see this emerging faint glow, just like this. Very bright, very conspicuous. And if you have a small telescope or like the library telescope, something really amazing happens. As you draw in and start putting some magnification on this, you're going to start to slowly resolve the edges of these millions and millions of stars. And depending on the size of your telescope and the magnification, you can go deep, deep, deep into a globular cluster. Again, just this tightly bound a group of millions of stars. I think the number that of existing globular clusters in our Milky Way galaxy is something like 150. And this is one of the very brightest ones in the Northern Hemisphere. So just point that out to you. Try to find the keystone. If you've got binoculars, at least see this glow of the globular cluster M13. And if you've got a small telescope, drill in and check it out. It's amazing. All right, that was a whole lot. Last thing I'll say is we are offering some awards. We've got a log here of all the items that I just laid out. And on your observing guide, we have them listed. And I think there's 17 objects here. And so if you go out and you observe 12 of these 17 objects, we're going to and send us your log. So you've attended this meeting, you've gone out in February, and you've done this. We're going to send you a certificate and we're going to send you an NHAS t shirt. And yes, the certificate is breathtaking. It looks like this. So we'll be glad to mail that to you. And the challenge here, folks, is we actually had two, a, a third grader and a fifth grader from Master Cola Elementary just win the t-shirts for doing this. So gauntlet thrown down. All right, I have talked and talked and talked and we've covered a lot. I'd love to stop and just say, are there any questions or thoughts out there? Or observations? I see more people than I recognize. That's great. Hey, Tom. Hey, Paola. Good to see you. Tom, I, someone mentioned you today on a call, a business call. I'll have to connect to that for you. Hey, Wyatt. Yeah, Steve. Also, uh, <clears throat> along with the library telescopes, putting into libraries uh, in New Hampshire, planospheres, and these are now going into school libraries as well. Um, it's, uh, it does the same job as the chart that you were talking about. <clears throat> the only difference is that it's plastic, so it's weatherproof. And uh, instead of just uh, what you're gonna see for one month, uh, you dial in the date and the time and you can see what the sky is like uh, for, for any, any night of the year. So uh, that's a good thing to look, uh, look at as well. Cool. Oh, I've loved those. I've used those before. Those yeah, they're like fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. I think they cost 15 bucks and you can check them out for free, right? We do have one question from Susan, which is what's the best power of binoculars? Uh, for example, 20 by 70. Um, for handheld astronomy, low power binoculars and lightweight binoculars are best. Um, and so we're talking eight power, you know, something like that, maybe 10 power. Um, there are binoculars that are image stabilizing that let you go higher than that without a tripod, but uh, the larger it gets and the higher the magnification it gets, the more difficult it is to handhold. So um, I jokingly, truly, these are 1920 opera glasses. You would be <laughs> amazed what you can do with these. There's an, actually a classic wonderful book out there called Astronomy with an Opera, meaning opera glasses. So uh, use what you've got to start with um, and take it from there. Other questions in the chat or live? No questions, uh, Wyatt, but just observation. Um, the binoculars, you can even get down to a, a three power binocular that the Vixen makes that gives yeah. you very, very wide field views of the sky. So you're seeing whole you know, constellations and, and everything else. And they're pretty neat. And the prices come down on those just recently. 
yeah, I've got a pair, Tom, and, and they are, it's amazing, right? Um, it's amazing to just go with simple binoculars and see what it, suddenly you can see in these wide fields. It's very engaging. All right, I see my sister Amy there from Texas. Amy, good to see you. Thanks for joining. <laughs> good to see you too, Wyatt. All right. Well, folks, we're at the top of the hour. I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's interesting. Um, please e email me, president at nhas.com. I'm glad to send you the observing guide, uh, the observing log. The Astronomical Society is here for you, for those of us who are guests, to help you out with any of this. Once we get the pandemic behind us, we're going to be out across the state again doing public sky watches. We'd love to have you join us. You can follow our events on our Google Calendar on the website at nhas.com. Uh, and we hope you'll come out for these. We're going to do these sky tours quarterly. Uh, and we hope you will consider joining us and coming out and helping um, do this kind of education around the state and just participating and learning with the members. So it's been great to see you. Thank you very much. We'll post this recording to our YouTube channel. You can also check us out on Facebook and Clear Skies. Hey, Wyatt, Thanks, I have Wyatt. one more quick, quick question for you. That resource guide, where is it located? Uh, I've, I, I will post it for the membership, Tom, but okay. we can, um, anybody who isn't a member, if you want it, just email me and I'll send it to you. Great. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you. Good Have night. a nice night. Thank you so Thanks. much. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks, everybody.